Brilliant. Brilliant, Peter. I love that. That was really great. Yes. And we are recording. Peter, hello. Good afternoon. It's excellent to see you. Um, and uh, we are here to discuss a brilliant book that you put across my path that I'm trying to share with as many people as possible. And, um, and I just hope that we can have a little discussion about that this afternoon, but it's really good to see you. Um, just for those who are watching um, who don't know who I am, my name is Richard Matcham and I'm the pastor at Taunton Baptist Church. Uh, Peter, why don't you just say a little something about yourself and maybe even something about your former profession, because that's pretty gee whiz. Uh, a long time ago, but uh, yeah. I studied physics and worked in physics uh, in the nuclear industry for most of my working life and uh, retired in Bournemouth and now live in Taunton and have a new life here and uh, enjoying visiting and attending as a member of your church. Wonderful. Well, you came you came here just a few months before I did, and, uh, and I'm so glad that you did with your wife, uh, Bua and uh, such a gift to the church in, in so many ways. And, and apart from the lockdown, we hope that we can continue, you know, to kind of just get to know each other as well. Um, one of the things that you haven't said in your brief introduction was that you are, uh, what's the best way to call it? Your hobby, your, your retirement hobby is, is theology, isn't it? And, and Bible study and things like that. Do you want, can you say something about that before we launch into our little discussion about the, uh, about the book? Yeah, I, I realise I'm an oddity in many respects. I enjoy studying and uh, the, the lockdown hasn't been difficult for me because I'm happy to be studying <laughs> theology, but other things as well. I still study a bit of science and economics and that's politics good. and all that's sorts. So quite uh, range. That's quite a range though, Peter, isn't it? That's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's, that's not I, all of it. Either, no. never mind. <laughs> all right, OK, maybe for another time then. I think you're probably like Paul. He was probably quite happy to be locked up in prison sometimes. As long as he could get his, uh, his, you know, his cloak to keep him warm and his, and his parchment so he could do some writing, I think he was quite happy. And his books, yeah. of course, you know, which was his instruction to Timothy, wasn't it? Okay, um, Peter, we are going to discuss the book that you brought across my path. I've managed to put a print out of the, the title there so that it is, it is in view as well. But it's this one here, which is a book by um, um, Rod Dreyer, who I hadn't heard of before. Not, not that I recall anyway, which is quite surprising. But his previous book, The Benedict Option, is a book that I want to read during the, the upcoming Lent season. But you popped this book into my study at the church and said, you need to read this. And I'm currently reading three or four other books at the moment, but it kept catching my eye. So when I finished one of the books, I picked it up and I read it all last week. And I think if Rod Dreher is correct, as... The, the evidence is seen in the fact that we're doing this interview, which probably means that I think he is. This is an extremely important book. So before I say what I thought was important, what grabbed my attention, why don't you tell, uh, tell me why you thought it was worth my read? What grabbed your attention? Sure. I, I think most of us are aware that society around us is changing, changing a lot. Rapidly, yeah. And um, many aspects are, are not for the better, particularly for my generation. Uh, some of it can be quite disturbing, actually. But a lot of the things are isolated things here and there. What, what the book did for me was to bring together a lot of apparently isolated things and string them together in a way that made a coherent sense from them. And particularly what he's presented is that there is a threat that's coming. In fact, he says it's coming quickly down the line. And uh, I agree with you. I mean, we can't say, yes, he's 100 percent right. But there's certain enough, certainly enough there to make us concerned or we ought to be concerned, particularly as Christians, because what we're finding is happening is very counter to what God teaches us in the Bible, the word of God. So potentially there's a conflict down the road for us and we need to be ready for it. Um, so outline the conflict that you think uh, Rod Dreher is trying to express to us in his book. Yeah, the, the conflict is that our culture is moving towards 
we, we've all maybe all heard phrases like wokeness, political correctness, social justice. And on the face of it, just words. And unless you start looking into it, you probably won't take much notice. But when you do, you realize that the ideas behind it, just take social justice for an example, has its origin. Which, which, which Peter, is, is a decent phrase and a good idea. Social justice is a good thing. So, yeah, so yeah. Bearing, bearing that in mind, what's gone wrong? Yeah. Well, the, the origin of social justice is in Christianity, you know, and anybody who studied the Old Testament, minor prophets in particular, perhaps, sees that God is very concerned in justice for people, especially the oppressed and the poor. So one would think that this is a good thing if people are concerned with social justice, but they've redefined it as, as many things. So the, the modern, as opposed to the classical liberals, if we can call them modern progressive liberals, for instance, yeah. one of the things they like to do is to take some ideas from Marxism and change the words and the meaning. And yeah. it gives a nice feeling. But when they say social justice, they're talking about, uh, I mean, my, I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is that they are taking ideas like um, groups being um, oppressed or oppressors. So if I can give an example, as I understand it, um, according to these new social justice warriors, as they call them. SJWs. SJWs, yeah, not JWs. No, SJWs. <laughs> no. <laughs> old school now, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that's my trade at the moment. No, um, sorry, according to the, uh, the social justice warriors. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they think of uh, social justice as being in terms of groups. So the oppressors are not necessarily the rich and who we might logically think of as oppressors, but they are certain groups who are privileged and by definition, they become oppressors. So perhaps... Uh, the, some of the worst among these oppressors is white, uh, male, heterosexual Christians. Yeah. So by definition, we are oppressors. Yeah. And the language guilty. Of, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're all guilty without having any charge laid against us and defending ourselves. By definition, we are oppressors. So this is the sort of thing we're facing. And you can take lots of different labels and you find the same sort of thing behind it. Yeah, he has a chapter on, on woke culture, doesn't he? Um, and, and, and social justice warriors and all of those kind of things and yeah. how it seems to have been the, the terms which are good in themselves, not woke, but, but, you know, political correctness when used rightly is a good thing. But woke culture is political correctness gone nuclear on steroids, isn't it? It's, it's gone completely toxic. Yeah. And there's, there's no escape for the group that is not the in group. And I wonder whether a kind of contemporary uh, illustration would be something in terms of the re re rewriting of uh, redefining of these terms. When we consider that the statue issue that we've seen in this country and in America, yeah. Yeah. there's also a, a kind of rewriting or a whitewashing or a, a denial of history as it actually is. Yeah. So it's almost like one has to be utterly sinless Otherwise, you need re-educating out of that sin. And mm -hmm. it's always the in-group that would be advocating for that, the statue to come down, the education programme to be taught, the re-education programme. So it's, it's, a, it's a real thing in our culture. There's the, these movements are very powerful behind it, aren't they? And Rod Dreher talks mm -hmm. about that in here. OK, so, so take that. That's a, that's a very much a contemporary thing. He ties this in with the, the, the neo-Marxist movement of the left. Uh, in the context of uh, communist Russia uh, in decades, recent decades, and the collapse of the Eastern European Soviet satellite states, um, and the hard totalitarianism there. Now, this book is centered around the soft totalitarianism that's coming into the West, notably through a, a, a hidden leftist agenda, neo-Marxist culture, and so on. But 
Do you want to say something a little bit about what does Rod Dreher mean by this soft totalitarianism? And why, why should we Christians, why should our culture be concerned? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fundamental to the whole idea, I think. We, when we think of totalitarianism, I think we naturally think of the likes of Soviet communism or even going back to Nazism. And he, he refers to those as hard totalitarianism in the sense that they're brought in by, by fear, by pain, by, by force. And, uh, you know, you argued with them at the cost of being tortured or losing your life, certainly imprisonment. But it's different now. So the totalitarianism that he's referring to, which he calls soft totalitarianism, it's bringing about very similar things, but not by the, the rule of force in the same way. So, for instance, uh, if you take the example of the surveillance society, um, we are being surveilled in a way that has never been before. He, he quotes examples in the book of Christians during the, the communist times in, I think the particular one he mentioned is in Czechoslovakia. And they had wires in the walls with microphones to, yeah. to tap their conversation. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. They, they wouldn't dream of having microphones voluntarily in their, in their rooms now, but we do. Some of us have even got something called Alexa and the like. You can talk to it. It's a two-way process. So all of our phones locate us and record that, that location, and that goes to a central depository. So all our locations carrying our phones for the last few years are all stored up. They're not being used against us at the moment. They're only being used for our convenience. And therein lies the problem. Because especially, I think the younger we are, the more susceptible we are because we can make use of it very effectively. It's very useful to us. So there's an issue of convenience and comfort. Yeah. And the modern person enjoys convenience and comfort, as do I. But what it's, he's making clear in, in, in the book is that this is the thin end of the wedge. And the direction that it's going to, he, he quotes China as an example. They have something called the social credit system. Yes, this sounds and awful, doesn't it? It does sound awful, but the Chinese people generally they accept it and they consider it beneficial because it enables them to, to work within the, the boundaries of what they're permitted to do and to gain by it. So th this is the danger of these things. The social credit system is actually used to punish some and they lose all sorts of privileges like being able to have a higher education or travel on certain trains or things like that. Oh, is it, are we walking into a trap then, Peter? Is this something that is going, is just wrapping around us? It's, it's becoming so convenient that we can't live without it. I'm talking about the technology aspect now. I mean, in the context of, say, Alexa, for example, to an Eastern European who survived communist Russia and the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Iron Curtain and all of that, that must leave a lasting legacy. When we, when we voluntarily bring these things in, we're yeah. assuming that the state will always be good. But I suppose Rod Dreher and many, many others as well. This has been my reading of culture for, for, for 20 odd years now. There's a, there's a trend and a trajectory going on here. Mm. That, that, and history tells us that we can't assume that that will be the case, that they will be good or liberal, secular, whatever. We're already seeing the signs of that slight leftist squeeze, aren't we? We are. I know you're um, a student of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Well, I only read made... the Gulag Archipelago just last year, and that's the only thing I've read of his. But yeah, it was profound. Right. But yeah. Well, he, he makes the point that the greatest mistake people could make was thinking that the Soviet Union would be the only application of these principles. And uh, yes. I think he was thinking of the West when he said that. Because he delivered that lecture in the West, didn't he, when he wrote that? Because the, that's, the, that's the opening line in the introduction to the book, which, if I could read it, says, yeah. there's always this fallacious belief. This is Alexander Solzhenitsyn, by the way. There's always this fallacious belief. And the belief is this. 
It would not be the same here. Here, such things are impossible. That's what we Westerners would say. And then he says, alas, all the evil of the 20th century is possible everywhere on earth. And it seems that there's something about these people, Alexander Solzhenitsyn and, and his uh, family group of people who have lived through this, know exactly what they're talking about. And it's frightening. Hence the title of the book, another Solzhenitsyn phrase, tell the truth. Stop telling lies. Call out lies when it happens. Don't live by the lie. Uh, live not by lies, which is such a beautiful, honest, short, pithy uh, phrase, isn't it? So powerful yeah. to, to live truthfully. Um, yeah. And if there's ever a man that did it that is needed for this time, it would be him. So I'm glad that that uh, Jordan Peterson talks about is a student of Alexander Solzhenitsyn as well. Um, he, he talks about truth and uh, truth telling and, and not telling lies in his book, 12 Rules for Life. So this, the Alexander Solzhenitsyn influence is rubbed off there as well. It's had a massive influence um, in recent years as well. So this, this idea of not telling a lie seems to, be, uh, seems to be new, but it's not new, is it? It's no, one of the Ten Commandments, you know, <laughs> don't bear false witness. <laughs> Tell the truth is effectively part of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So, and, and this is very deliberately a Christian book. So, so what, is, what is Rod Dreher encouraging based on the stories that he's, that he's told, the interviews that he's conducted with these incredible people? So, I mean, it's just, it's astonishing. Some of the, the level of insight and, and wisdom that's been collected that is now coming back over into our Western culture. And we... I think a lot of people intuitively know, Peter, don't they, that we're at a pivotal point in our collective Western liberal de democratic civilization. Something's happening, isn't it? Whether yeah. we're approaching a tipping point or at it or just going down the other side, something significant is happening and our culture yeah. is changing, isn't it? So what do you think, or well, could you articulate for us what his response is? Because it's pretty good, isn't it? It's pretty sort of first century church. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as you say, it's it's quite moving and challenging and at the same time encouraging that the conversations that basically he, he talked to these um, people from who'd experienced communism in Eastern Europe and they were firsthand sufferers, basically, in many cases, they'd been to prison or they were the, the relatives of people who had. And the point that, uh, that he, he makes, and I, I found this perhaps the most, most how can I say, more than moving, it, it, it was the key thing for me in the book, uh, the chapter on suffering. Yeah. Oh, Not talking yeah. about the suffering, which is the normal part of human experience, Twice, yeah. but the suffering that comes from when you are faced with a decision to live by the truth and to tell the truth or not, yeah. And you know that if you make the right decision, there's going to be a consequence and you will suffer. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's not something that people like me or any Christians in the West have had to face in the past. And the fundamental point he's making, I think, is that this is what's coming down the line. And we can see inklings of it already if you read your newspapers and uh, yes. yeah. what's happening. Well, take, so, take, a, take a contemporary example. The thin end of the wedge, as you mentioned earlier, would be something like a nurse being sacked for offering to pray for a patient. That is the thin end of the wedge. A liberal society doesn't do that. Uh, and so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's only a ramping up from that moment onwards, isn't there? So that is a kind of one example at, a, 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 at the thin end. But the fat end of this wedge is the is the flowering of the soft totalitarianism is that about right i'm sure that's right yeah i mean there are so many aspects to it but um i, I think that the second part of his book is about how christians in the past yeah. have dealt with this and they so have in almost every generation it's amazing isn't it the, the, yeah. the richness that's there yeah it's, it's almost like a handbook for us to understand and prepare yeah for the future. Um, I mean, we all hope and pray that 
the cup will pass us by, I think is the phrase that he uses. But we shouldn't assume, I, don't, I think we would be um, unwise just to assume that we won't have to face these things. And the, or, or uh, we don't want to be like Hezekiah, at least it won't happen in my lifetime. As, yeah. though, as though that's a good thing. As long as I'm safe, that's, that's all that matters. That, that famous Hezekiah response to the, the invasion of the Assyrians, um, it's inadequate, isn't it? There is something about get, we need to get ready. We need to get ready now, whether we know it will be in our lifetime or not, because it's coming, isn't it? It is coming. It, it is. I mean, I, I don't have children, but people who do, this is even more important for them. Yeah because they need to prepare their children, who certainly will face more than we, someone like me will have to face in the future. Yeah. So there's a, quite a wide range of things so to he, learn from. He talks about several, several ways to do this, doesn't he? He talks about small groups, the groups in Eastern Europe or even in, in the, the, the former Soviet Union, the underground church that they were, they were teaching, they were educating, they were reminding themselves of their Christian history which is to say their christian memory they were catechizing their youth in other words they were giving them the the essential christian doctrine um, to be able to be a, a disciple that can say no to a tyrant that can stand up to tyranny um, and, and that's something that the early church that's a foundational aspect of the early church isn't it the small groups the house church the underground church the catacomb church um, there's something very powerful about that. And it's, it's, a, it's, for me, thinking about a soft totalitarianism, does that mean then that I have to very, very carefully as a Christian, as a church minister, as a teacher and preacher in the church, and as someone who says, I, I try and read culture and interpret it, as Jesus said, we have to interpret culture. How, how far am I willing to go with big tech? How far am I willing to not ask the, the questions of of privacy invasion um and you know the list goes on and on doesn't it it's an astonishing thing to stand up to it if i can't feed my family but interesting the the uh, invasion of our privacy with big tech it's, it's not christians who are leading the way in arguing with that now it's actually much wider in fact even what's it president um Mer merkel was complaining about that I even saw a few days ago Vladimir Putin, of all people, giving a speech at the World Economic Forum. I, I, I sat through it, which uh, <laughs> not the sort of thing. <laughs> but ironically, even he is pointing out the dangers of big tech. Right, right. So it, it really is an, an issue. Yes. And, uh, and we've seen them cancel individuals and whole other internet companies that don't quite align with their, frankly, it is a neo-Marxist um, emerging tyranny, isn't it? There is something something massive to do with um, cancel culture, which is all part of the wokeness. Uh, how, how can we out-woke each other? Well, if we cancel everybody, then ev there's nobody. That's, that's no good for anybody, is it? It's a kind of, it's like a, a cult of death, isn't it? There's no sense of human flourishing unless you're perfect. And nobody is. We, we can't live up to those. It's, it's like a, a Puritanism, but without God. There's, it is it's like, it's like a, an unholy holiness code to yeah. me that is just unlivable. So people are being cancelled or losing their jobs if a tweet is found from 10 years ago that yeah. may or may not mean what they think it means. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more toxic, which is astonishing. If I could read a quote from page 173 in uh, Rod Dreher's uh, wonderful book by a guy called Sipko, who is, uh, as far as I can quickly tell, was in Soviet Russia. He said, Christianity has become a secondary foundation in people's lives and not the main foundation. Now it's all about career, managerial success and one standing in society. In these small groups, when people were meeting back then, the center was Christ and his word was being read uh, and being interpreted as applicable to your own life with alarming consistency. That bit is my own. Um, what, I'm supposed to, what am I supposed to do as a Christian? What am I doing as a Christian together with my brothers? 
was checking my own Christianity. It's almost like you're identifying the dead wood, really. We know why we're Christian and we know what we're doing and we know what we've got to stand up to. And, and these Christians hunkered down, didn't they? And kind of they fought the fight for the sake of the next generation that would emerge out of this communist dictatorship, this horror show that, uh, that the, the, the Iron Curtain was. Um, and he, on the next page, Rod Dreher just says something like the institutional churches and their ministers will continue to be inadequate to the challenge of forming their congregations for effective resistance if they don't pay any attention to this level. And I'd, I'm normally quite suspicious of alarmism or hysterical screeching from the pulpit or from the academy or wherever it might be. Or from pub uh, or from writers i kind of have an a, 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 an antennae that spots that shrill um cry from from these people who just want to sell books but there's so, that the title of the book gives it away there's something honest about this isn't there that i i i couldn't get away from and i found that really refreshing and terrifying um do you want to just do you want to just sum up something anything that you're thinking of now as we come to a close peter um, that you would like to say regarding the book um, and then I'll, I'll conclude our discussion here which has been really helpful thank you yeah just one of the points he makes is that um, bear in mind that he's talking at largely about Christians in America and the system there and anybody who works in a large corporation in the United States where there's a human resources department will find that the, the way that it operates is that the, the requirements of the, the human resources department is almost like a, you're having to make a, a statement of orthodoxy yeah. of wokeness. Yeah. And woe betide you if you say something that's outside the, the bounds, as it were. Yeah. So employment has become moderated by these big companies and Whereas we might have thought that the main threat was coming from uh, a statist government, it clearly isn't. It's coming from these corporations. Yes. And uh, you they, mentioned and they, big tech. And they're using, and la using language, sorry, Peter, of, of um, unconscious bias training courses, which is yeah. slightly slipped out of fashion now, because I think we are intuitively as a culture realizing how stupid that is. If you are, like you said, white, male, heterosexual, you're that, you're that scapegoat group of people um, in this woke view of the world, which is frankly just a horror show. If you're not racist, um, you, you still need to go on the unconscious bias training because your racism is unconscious. You don't know that you're racist. Mm. So in other words, there is no escape from the accusation. There's mm. no escape from the in-group scapegoating the out group and i find that fascinating dynamic because again going back to scripture the bible itself which is the most honest book about the state of the human condition and our need and its solution which is christ talks about the scapegoat mechanism in the old testament under the law a scapegoat is is um is a is a, is a sacrifice not well one is one goat is sacrificed the other one has the sins of the people placed on its head and it's sent out into the wilderness where it will probably die christ as our sacrifice is also our scapegoat so the bible has a whole paradigm of this this ideology that's been completely perverted and distorted that if if these sjw's recognized that to some degree i think they'd be astonished i think they think they've discovered the silver bullet but they haven't they have discovered an old religion that has been talking about this for millennia that's how foolish they are because again it comes back to history if you want to whitewash history and start again today at year zero there'll be a there'll be a massacre and an atrocity and another holocaust not far down the road and and as, as alarmist as that sounds that's how i can see a soft totalitarianism kind of working which is quite frightening, isn't it? But I'm up for the fight, Peter. I know you are. I'm really grateful that you gave me this, um, that, that you gave me this book, which I'm now hoping 
that in the light of this interview with a few people in church and a few people, uh, a few friends as well, maybe with half a dozen people or so, to start a book club going through this, because Rod Dreyer has also done a wonderful um, study guide for it, which I've got printed out here, um, which just helps us think about these things in a group where we can challenge some of the ideas, maybe try and work out how or why we might agree or disagree with, with some, of the, some of the concepts or some of the ideas that he's come up with. Um, but what I'm hoping to do is do a book club. I, and I'd love it if you could join us as well, Peter, um, whether that'll be on, in this forum online or whether we do that uh, in person when we're able to. Um, because I think this would be, uh, I can't think of anything more urgent uh, in, in terms of biblical Christianity, teaching and discipling uh, those that will go through this, that need to go through this and will come out the other end and tell the stories. But it's about recognizing our responsibility in this too, isn't it? To, to stand on the truth, which a postmodern world says, well, there are multiple truths, which is self-defeating, as we know, because that's a truth claim in its own right. So there is a truth to know, isn't there? The truth is Christ, and we want to stand on that rock, and we want to be able to, uh, to, to, to shore up uh, the, the generation that will go through this. I think this is absolutely crucial. Uh, so, Peter, I want to thank you for bringing this to my attention. I've seen about half a dozen of Rod Dreher's interviews on YouTube with, with, with various different people, and every single one offers a new insight. It's fascinating to, to listen to him. And uh, to, to, I just wish that I'd been with him. I'd carried his bags or something so that I could go and meet some of the people that he's seen, because they're the heroes. These, these guys are, are just absolute legends of the, of the faith, and we will be talking more about those in future generations for sure any final words peter no that's brilliant thank you <laughs> it's been great to see you thank you so much yeah. and uh keep in touch send me some more books all right okay not that i don't have enough but you know what i mean <laughs> take care